विवेकानंद सर मैं कंफर्म गुड इवनिंग मिस्टर जीनो गुड इवनिंग सर सर आई होप वी कैन स्टार्ट फॉर्मली शैल वी सर आई रेडी व्हेन एवर यू आर या वी हैव अ कंपेयरिंग we have two guys for comparing and uh, uh, an official forum is there so i'm just leaving it to them uh, sandeep sir yes am i am i audible gayatri yes. madam yes am i audible yeah okay okay jina sir thank you so much uh, this is sandeep from the technical committee of eljara uh, we are the person who are organizing this uh, webinar from a technical time uh, technical side i request all the participants to switch off their mic and switch on their cam video camera uh, at all times throughout the session and uh, cooperate for the smooth con conducting of this webinar and for uh, initiating this uh, session uh, webinar without any delay i invite uh, the comparing team first uttara uttara will be starting the comparing uttara thank you so much sir Ladies and gentlemen, we request all the guests to be kindly settled as we are going to start the function in a few minutes. We also request everyone present over here to kindly make sure that your videos and microphones remain muted for the smooth conduct of the function. Thank you. To deny people their human rights is a challenge. the very humanity as said by nelson mandela the galaxy of intellectuals and luminaries hello and a very warm welcome to all of you to this beautiful and wonderful evening myself futra along with my friend gayatri ch take the privilege to warmly welcome each and every one of you to this magnanimous occasion of the international human rights day celebration Dr Ambedkar Memorial Lecture Series organized by Loan Justice Research Foundation in association with the Mandava Science Foundation I'm sorry Gayatri you are on mute Can you hear me Yeah now it's okay Thank you thank you so much So a flag does not fly because of the wind it flies with the last breath of each soldier who died protecting it ladies and gentlemen as a token of our love respect and homage to our most respected and beloved general mr bipin lakshman singh rawat and his wife and all other brave hearts of our country who lost their precious lives in the shocking and unfortunate event of the chopper crash at kunur let us now observe a minute of silence to pay them our tribute saluting each of those brave hearts A warm welcome is like a beautiful flower. It fills the heart with love and happiness, both at the giving and receiving ends. Now, making the beginning of the great session, may I take the privilege of inviting respected Mr. Gino M. Kurian, member, State Chapter, LJRF, to kindly deliver the welcome speech and address the gathering. I welcome you, sir. Thank you, Uttara. I am one of the members of the State Chapter LJR of Law, Justice, and Research Foundation. Uh, I am so happy to welcome all of you this event. My responsibility to convey welcome to all of our dignitaries and all of you have gathered in this particular session. Today we have uh, this is a fifth uh, uh, edition of our Dr. Ambedkar Memorial Lecture, along with uh, International Human Rights Celebration. Uh, by ljr of in association with mandava science foundation today's session will be presided over by professor dr bismi gopalakrishnan madam madam is uh, the dean of faculty of law mg university i welcome you to the to this particular session ma'am we have two well known speakers professor dr bc vivekananda sir Sir is the Vice Chancellor of Hidayatullah National Law University, Raipur. Uh, 
he is also a well known source person so we are uh, proud to welcome you to this particular session sir also we have advocate nagaraj narayan sir is a famous lawyer at kerala high court also current director of kerala law academy law college i welcome you also this uh, to this particular session nagaraj sir and to deliver felicitation we have dr level man sir is an assistant professor of government law college calicut and mr patma kumar mm sir is a patron of mandava science foundation i welcome both of you to this particular session sir we have mr chindu joseph who will be delivering vote of thanks say so, uh, president of uh, district chapter of ljrf i welcome chindu also to this particular event along with all of you ljrf members and all the faculties students and who all are interested and joined in this particular session i welcome all of you to this event thank you i welcome all of you thank you so much for those wonderful words sir, from your side sir they were really heartwarming and highly affable gaining knowledge is the first step to wisdom and sharing it is the first step towards humanity ladies and gentlemen we are profusely overjoyed to take this opportunity to welcome respected professor dr bismi govalakrishnan honorable dean faculty of law mahatma gandhi university kottayam who has blessed this gathering with her gracious presence here today ma'am we are so happy to have you here with us and we welcome you over to the screen for the presidential address thank you guys uh, honorable vice chancellor uh, of hidayatullah national law university professor dr vc vivekanandan sir um bagrash narayan sir director kerala law academy uh, dr lawel man sir uh, dr padma kumar sir uh, chintu joseph jinu m kurian uh, all from the ljrf family and all the ljrf uh, family and uh, the students uh, research scholars and uh, faculty members who are attending this particular international day uh, celebration of and the um, ambedkar memorial uh, foundation lecture organized by ljrf so uh, basically uh, as we all know this is uh, we are celebrating the human rights day that is uh, the udhr uh, uh, is a milestone document that proclaims uh, that uh, proclaims rights that everyone is entitled to as a human being regardless of their race color religion sex language political national origin and birth now this udhr is the most translated document in the world which is available in more than 500 languages so human rights is the heart of the sustainable development goals also which means in the absence of human dignity we cannot hope to drive sustainable development now the theme of human rights day of 2021 as all of us are aware is reducing inequalities and advancing human rights so this th year's theme is actually it's very close to equality which is enshrined in article 1 of udhr which says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights so the principles of equality and non discrimination are uh, is that one of the yes cementing it, it as the heart of human rights so the un approach set out in the document includes uh, addressing and finding solutions for discrimination that have affected several people in the society so inequality inclusion and non discrimination a uh, human right based approach development uh, can be regarded as the best way to reduce inequality so inequality if we just analyze the word inequality it can be defined in various ways and the generic term inequality actually reflects a range of distinct inequalities we have horizontal and vertical inequalities so horizontal inequality is defined in as inequality between culturally defined or socially constructed groups inequalities with respect to gender race ethnicity religion caste and sexuality are all examples of horizontal inequalities 
and vertical inequality refers to the inequality between individuals or household um, between households so uh, we're just uh, waiting to hear from the uh, two great uh, speakers and uh, here we have to uh, uh, remember uh, one of the <clears throat> the books that is uh, was written by Samuel Moyen not enough human rights in an unequal world where uh, he he raises a lot of questions as far as human rights and inequality is concerned as to how human rights should be conceived yeah. and how what they imply for the international political practice so Samuel Moyne's critique on human rights is uh, it, it's something we all of us can think about because he raises a lot of questions uh, are human rights uh, um, sufficient or is it minimalistic are they problematically individualistic? Do they issue a commitment to institutional reform? Have they shared the limelight with the neoliberal political economy while falling in rain and growth of material inequality? Are human rights incapable of limiting such inequality? And more fundamentally, does accepting human rights have any distributive implications? So uh, as a notion of human rights spread, we also have difference of thoughts also pouring in. So without losing any time, we'll just listen to uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Browser, Dr. V.C. Vivekananda, sir, and also um, Nagaraj Narayan, sir, eagerly waiting to hear that. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your kind words. We feel extremely fortunate to be able to listen to your words. Thank you so much. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more and do more and become more you are a leader on this note may i now have the honor of inviting respected professor vc vivekanandan honorable vice chancellor hidayatullah national university raipur to kindly come over the screen and share his great words of wisdom with us i welcome you sir Uh, Vivekananda sir, we are about to hear from you. We are mute now. Sandeep, can you unmute and see you, sir? Yeah, I hope I'm audible now. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes. I'm sorry, you, sir. I missed a bit of your introduction uh, because I had some major surge here. So, uh, uh, you can proceed. I'm now with you. In yes, sir. Putra, can you welcome, sir? Sure, sir. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, and do more, and become more, you are a leader. On this note, may I now invite respected Professor V.C. Vivekanandan, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Hidayatullah National University, Raipur, to kindly come over the screen and share his great words of wisdom with us. I welcome you, sir. Thank you very much. I hope I am audible. Yes, sir. Thanks. So, Sri. Mr. Narayanan, uh, my co-speaker and panelist today, uh, Mr. Gino Kurian, who facilitated for me to address all of you, uh, Dean Professor Bismi, other important dignitaries, participants. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Frankly speaking, it would have been a greater pleasure if you have physically invited me to Kerala because there is one place I will never say no, you know, if some invitation comes. Because I think, you know, it's not just me. I think uh, not only the expat Keralites, all over people love to come to Kerala. But as you said that we need to wait for good times to turn back to come to Kerala. Otherwise, my connection with um, Kerala has been through my friends in Chennai. And uh, also, I have roamed almost many streets in Trivandrum and Cochin. You know, after my degree, when I was doing a lot of freelancing work, trying to, you know, earn something uh, in the sense because uh, I was quite defiant with my father, as every first son will be normally, and trying to earn money. So I did some market research survey, which led me to go to every small gully in Trivandrum, as well as Cochin. So I had a fairly good idea, which I'm telling about three decades back. After that, uh, you know, a lot of evolution in life. And then I've been... Uh, coming there for on and off 
you know, to in, including the Vikram Sarabhai uh, Institute to deliver mostly my lectures were on intellectual property rights and, you know, internet law. And I do have some great friends, academics, uh, you know, who are uh, even working with me and others who are connected with Kerala. So it would have been a great pleasure when I got this uh, invite from Mr. Gino Korean that I did not uh, think much and hesitate much. I said yes. But as obviously when he said about, um, when I said any topic, I was just keeping one topic in my mind, which is about media. How is that connected? I had some history behind it. I tried for my master's in journalism when way back after my degree, I did not get a seat. That is Madras University used to have about 10 to 12 seats. And they asked me to get a sponsorship from a newspaper much before joining so that I can get a seat. But hardly I knew there are only two papers in Chennai at that time, the very dominant and uh, omnipresent Hindu paper. And then there used to be an evening paper called Mail, and uh, which has stopped long back. And uh, I went and the Gurkha did not even allow me inside. So I did not get any sponsorship. So my media dream evaporated. I joined my master's in public administration, then into law, all that. But later on, I had a great opportunity to work with media when uh, I was in National Law School of India, where I started my career under Dr. Madhu Menon, who is another uh, distinguished Keralaite, who has been my mentor when I joined here in, in National Law School, Bangalore. And then I left National Law School. I wouldn't pretend great ideology because the money was very less those days in academics. I could not really meet ends in Bangalore. So I thought I, that was an attractive offer from a business journal, which asked me to come and join with them. So I did go and join with the business journal uh, as a kind of a, a kind of a, they do not give designation, they said correspondent. And then probably I, in the, uh, and I grew up in the ranks and became an editor within a few years. And then I was a little tired of uh, uh, journalism. Then I went to come back to law school. And again, I joined back in law school in the late 90s. And when I joined back, there's a different director now, Dr. Mitra, who told me that you have been exposed to media why don't you start a media law center and also try to use your media network to do some legal workshops, etc. So that was another way of, you know, sustaining. So in a way, I was in practically into media, like uh, everyday humdrum of media running around, uh, competing with the, your own colleagues within the journal. It is not even outside competition. You have to find your own space of trying to compete with your own editor about, you know, give me some place to write. And then you also have to compete with others outside. That was a very, what I call as a, a very, very, very doggy dog world. But when I went back to do the media law studies, etc., that gave me a different insight about my practical experience. I took uh, some leaf out of that. And then we started doing a center for media law. Of course, it did not sustain long. One of the reasons uh, I moved out to Nalsar University in Hyderabad. There were no much takers in that area. But that has been always there with me, the question about media, media law. And that has been part and parcel of my life, apart from your quote unquote law professor. Always you read media, you try to understand, analyze, and then probably start thinking about it. And that's how research happens. So in that context, I proposed to Mr. Gino that I will do this topic. That he said, uh, fine. Then he did ask me, sir, this is Ambedkar Memorial Lecture. Uh, will there be a connect? Then I said, I don't need to talk about Dr. Ambedkar and, you know, in the sense as a personality. But as I said, when you say Dr. Ambedkar, obviously everybody talks about law. Every lawyer knows about it. Everybody who in constitution knows about Dr. Ambedkar. And there is always a connect between media, constitution, and Dr. Ambedkar. But this connect how far is something interesting, which triggered me to little bit think after accepting this topic, because every time you keep thinking about uh, a, a kind of dimension. And so that is what I'm going to present to you next, maybe 20, 25 minutes to keep your time intact with uh, my co-panelists also going to speak. So this is how I'm going to do. Now, what I'm going to do is that uh, I, I do hope that um, I have the facility to share the uh, slides, it is easier sometimes to follow, right? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. I got this arrow mark. Uh, so Google, I use much less, right? 
uh, I go to what I call a screen. Am I right? Yeah, present now, sir. Okay. Present now. I understand. I've done that few times. Uh, now let me share the screen. And you can yeah. let me know whether the screen is shared. Yeah, it is shared, but not in the uh, now it is in the slideshow mode. Yeah, it's yeah. clear. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, let me go through the slide and then uh, maybe at the end of that, uh, we can have a little interaction or over the organizers are planning the interaction. So I just gave the title media conundrum in modern times. Conundrum is something a churning out what happens. So let me begin as uh, this is Ambedkar Memorial Lecture. Let me start with a quote from Dr. Ambedkar. This is often quoted. This interestingly was not now. We are talking about few decades, five, six decades back. Journalism in India was once a profession. It has now become a trade. Never has the interest of the country been sacrificed so senselessly for the propagation of hero worship. This was told long back. I need not bring in a fresh quote in today's world. I leave it to you to judge. It is not just I'm talking some outside neta. You, me are now part of self-propagation one way or the other. I think our craze for selfie will explain that suddenly we not only have heroes outside and we start having a hero worship of oneself. Is there anything wrong being hero worship or not is another question. We'll come and analyze a little bit there. Now, if I look at Ambedkar, he's a relegated media contributor in the outside world. Because when he said Dr. Ambedkar, you think something else. Nobody talks generally about his intense connect with media. In fact, he understood as a, pub, as a person, as a social reformer, as a constitutional expert, and also representing a segment which at that point of time you can understand what could have been the situation. Even this fig leaf of constitutional cover was not there. We are talking about six decades time where openly it's flouted. Today also it is flouted, but much more secretively than he thought that is the best way to, you know, really address and bring. So he is really talking about a newspaper, which is two, three he started, Muknayak, Bashirat Bharat, Samta and Prabuddha Bharat, all that. And the, why I said relegated media contributor, if I ask his contemporary Gandhi, everybody knows what Gandhi's newspaper and what a celebrity a writer he was. But here we only tell that Dr. Ambedkar means constituent assembly debates and constitution. And this particular facet is never a part of discussion. Is it uh, inadvertently happening? Or is it deliberate? Again, I will only not give my opinion on that. I leave it to the audience to take a cue. Now, in supporting of intercaste marriage in 1927, he writes this. At that point of time, there was an incident and all the media was baying for the blood of this intercaste marriage. People, you know, pro propagandist at that point of time, he writes in, in his Bharat that conjugal union and criticizing those who oppose interfaith marriages. He stated that interfaith marriages should be promoted. This is, I'm talking 1927. Transport yourself in a time machine. You will understand what was the situation around. Of course, he had other contemporaries all over India. I could remember from Tamil Nadu, you know, uh, it was Ivera Periyar who was even vehemently, you know, what you call as a posing caste system. And he was another you know, different type of reformer parallelly to Dr. Ambedkar, you know, happening in Tamil Nadu. Now, this is one of the, imp just a snippet for you to connect this memorial lecture with the topic what we are giving. Ambedkar speaks, each day our people are suffering under authoritarianism with no consideration and discrimination. Those who are not covered in the newspapers, by a planned conspiracy, the newspapers are involved in full-fledged silencing of the view Please remember, he's not talking about the British and the Indians. He is talking about a set of Indians, right, who are suffering from another set of Indians. And this is what he attacks the mainstream press that 
it, that is why it's often said, I'm not talking about transferring of power from one elite to another elite, but it should be real transfer and people who have been subjected to centuries has to be mitigated. And this he has very lucidly put it. You and I know the eloquent Constituent Assembly note, but when you, when you go into media and Ambedkar and look many of these things, you will really see the Ambedkar who is outside is uh, smilingly accepting the task given to him of you know uh, drafting the modern constitution but he has his own pain as himself as a part of an oppressed group now connecting ambedkar to media this is where i wanted to connect when mr gino said the constitution and ambedkar are synonymous in indian legal circles ambedkar and dalits are misplaced synonyms because ambedkar is not considered as a Pan-India leader. Mahatma Gandhi is rightfully, right? I'm not going to tell it is Ambedkar versus Gandhi, but Ambedkar, when it comes, we say that he is a hero to a group, which is, in my opinion, a misplaced synonym. Ambedkar and journalism is totally blacked out, fact, in India and media. How many could even, you know, talk about this, our, forget about common person, about any media talking, I don't see that. So to understand this whole thing about I call the dots, connect the dots of what the person called Ambedkar stood for, where does he come from, and what does he represent at a point of time, what are the larger discourse and the social map of this country, and then connect it with another word called media, which we often call as a fourth pillar, the three powers of separation, which is again, you know, Ambedkar and constitution, when we talk separation of powers, and then we talk about fourth pillar. We call it as a watchdog. But is it really a fourth pillar? Is it really a watchdog? One needs a bit of history when us to take. I would like to quote this. John Hofses is a Canadian writer and an activist for right to die. Very interesting. He says, the demi world of journalism is like the funhouse mirrors that one finds on carnival midways. In one reflection, you are too fat. In another, absurdly thin. In another with flat head, another without a head. Bizarre reflections, without resemblance, most times, of what is your real image? This you must have seen in our village level, you know, exhibitions. There is a small tent, they'll keep some different glasses. When you look, you get into that, as a child, we all enjoy, laugh and come out. So that's what he says. Funhouse mirrors is okay, but real life distortions are rare, is rarely a joke. In real life, what happens, the whole society is media a mirror in the carnival or is it media really mirroring things? And this is where, again, I'm connecting the dot of fourth estate, you call fourth pillar and the constituent uh, assembly debates or constitution and what Dr. Ambedkar, whom we are remembering in one way in Human Rights Day. But interestingly, I want you all to know a few things. The, it was originally a private initiative, not what we called as fourth pillar or watchdog. It was basically in the 300 years back, when you are looking at the shipping companies, which are touching their colonial ports, they were giving a tabloid. The tabloid will contain what the ship, next ship will bring. Next ship, how much space it has to take things back. So it's all between what we call in modern times B2B, business to business. It was nothing much. But when you write a tabloid, you don't fill up everything. There are gaps. When there are gaps, they started putting, you know, what you call as some news item. So originally, the media starts as an advertisement tabloid. And in between, they start putting something about UK or Netherlands, whichever may be the colonial country. And these kind of tabloids started coming, putting some news about the happenings in our the place of our masters. So this slowly what happens, it becomes fourth estate. Slowly that news catches more people. A lot of people who have no connection with this business start reading and then it starts emerging. When it emerged, even in the West, it paid a heavy price. For example, William Cobet was imprisoned for an article long back. The tradition continues even today. They even tried to put a stamp duty so that they call that very, very, very interesting. 
tax on knowledge, right? They want to tax knowledge. So it looks like taxing is something which will be done everywhere and anywhere for anything. So, but over a period, a lot of water has flown down, you know, in, in the West, in UK, under Thames or in Ganges or anywhere in this country, then you really find, yeah, I call that a yeah, behemoth or a conglomerate has developed. That conglomerate brings in various sectors, not necessarily about politics, not necessarily about uh, public issues. It brought sports, lifestyle, religion, science, technology, name it. Now, if I look at the disseminating, what this is media is, what it's supposed to do, what it ought to be. Let us look at one analysis. The word media is a plural of media. It mediates between whom? That is the question. Between public power holders and power generators. If you call their fourth estate, they are a holy cow when we say what role they should play. The role is between power holder and power generator. Power holder, you know, periodic governments, different governments come and governments have executive, all the judiciary, everything is part of power holder. A professor, an institution, you know, all we are all power holders. There are power generators, which means people who put you in power. So I can be a power holder as well as a power generator. I will also vote for a government as well as I may be discharging a function as a power holder. This is one way of one plane of analysis. The next way of analysis is private power holders among the private business, trade, voluntary organizations, individuals. I give a, you know, classified item to do something, to do a business or to look for a house or, you know, rent something and power generator. Then there is another way. So there are many ways of looking at it. Then there are power contenders and power generators. All the political parties are appealing to the power generators. Media becomes a very, very crucial platform. So this is, I'm just loosening up our thought instead of a very abstract sense media. Media is there for what? And media does what? And media in its core what it is. So if I look at the functional to the philosophical to the structural part, there is private and government control, industrial houses, party control, independent media houses. I will still put a question mark there. Monopoly ownership versus diversity of how media is held. Global media versus national, national versus regional, regional versus local. I will even say a word traditional and modern that I will take it up in the last part. So when I really look at it, there are many, many ways a matrix can be built. So it cannot be one singular or a binary way of looking at media and its functions and what finally it does about finally media is about people. Media is about our lives. Media is about ourselves in a way. So if you look at that, it the, what I call the algorithm becomes more and more complex. Now, when I disseminate the functional part, very interestingly, that is the structural part. Naturally, structure and function are connected. What is the kind of ownership which will have a connection? What is the kind of ideological disposition will have a connection? We may say that they are neutral. They are supposed to be equidistant. They are supposed to be not one-sided. Agreed. And I wouldn't say except for a party-controlled media outfit, which many political parties have their own. What use you use the word mouthpiece? We call it as mouthpiece, right? But they are they. We don't expect them to tell about the other side view. But majority, what is not party control, we will say sometimes if it is industry control, if that particular group owning a media something happens, they will not come out. So, but nevertheless, in a competitive world, they need to do breaking news. They have to do few things. What is happening? So there is also active medium and passive medium. What do you mean by active medium and passive medium? I I only understand uh, uh, an anecdote once told by one of the. You all must be knowing there was a famous uh, Shamal novelist and a script writer and science writer. His name is Sujata or is Rangarajan who's called Sujata. Is a, his iconic person is no more. Very interesting. One time I read with what he said. I'm narrating to you that he said uh, the about media and its character. He said media is a personality and they have their own characteristic way of reacting. He gave this illustration, which is 
interesting to share with you. He said, suddenly one day, people came to a conclusion the world will end today. This is now accepted by uh, what I call a scientist as well as astrologers. You know, both are very different people. So astrologers and scientists agreed world is going to end within 48 hours. So that is 100%. So now world is going to end day after tomorrow. The next day, media paper has to come. Newspaper has to come because it's a staple diet. So what newspaper headline will be about the day after tomorrow, inevitable happening of the world ends? Sujata gives this example, interestingly, humorously. He says, Hindu paper says, they are, tomorrow will the world end? Question mark. Our reporters will be on the field, analyze, and they will bring you an objective report by tomorrow evening, which means a very, very safe and a very, very analytical, a paper which wants to be very research-based. This was a joke on Hindu. Then he says, Indian Express says, the world ends tomorrow. Will It simply says, world ends tomorrow. The prime minister should step down now. Last day for him. Because Express supposed to be giving ultimatum to any establishment. Very interesting. Then he says, the third biggest, not the third, but the largest circulated, uh, I don't know about the stats now earlier, is Times of India, which says that World ends tomorrow, all classifieds, 90% reduction, right? You can book your ad. So this is how he was trying to tell, for you to get a feel about media character station and personality, socio-political or entertainment push, ad-driven or value-driven. Is it ideologically somewhere called as left of center or right of center? Or is it very pluralistic? where everybody comes and writes something and everybody gets published. Is it information alone or is it a strong agenda setting role? You know, it, it, these are the things which you need to put. I call that as a conundrum, the structural and the functional part of media today. Or at least four theories they used to tell, authoritarian theory, libertarian theory, Soviet theory, social responsibility. I will not dwell much there are a lot of media people who might have been attending this program today. They definitely must have been part of the syllabus. Authoritarian, it's, you know, these are all basically, uh, you find uh, governments, military takeover, maybe uh, erstwhile Iraq or Cuba or whatever. Or libertarian, again, there's a big question mark. There is something called free press theory, no restrictions. I really don't know. I have not come across no restrictions or there may be feeble attempts and experiments which might have died down, right? Media people to have complete freedom in the organization itself. No connection with the government and the media house, what you call it. It is like independent journalist group, etc. I'll come to that. There is a chance happening in this particular theory in the new media. I call that as social media. Now the Soviet, forget it, call it China now. Instead of Soviet, maybe it's fitting to propagate its own values, press as an instrument, Xinhua, you call it. It has got its own television, which, you know, which will tell that everything is okay with China, right? And then that is what the old theory, this is an old concept. The social responsibility theory is where many of us are desiring, but it's not happening. We all understand the failure of market-driven press in many ways. Government has the overriding authority when it is market-driven because... Uh, revenue models, many things. End of the day, whoever is maybe in the position of establishment, you have to listen to them. The social obligations of the media is never a discussion. It has to reflect the diversity. And this is where I call Ambedkar's clarion call came again to connect. He was lamenting, he was lambasting that the media is what the so called, even those days, I'm telling not now used to call that as Congress media because everybody knows uh, the independence movement. There was only one party, Congress party, which was, no, there were others who would have contributed, but as a political party, it was not even the today's Congress kind of thing, what you're talking. It's a kind of aspiration of many shades into Congress and the Congress and the lawyers and the press, everything was, you know, in tandem bringing in freedom. So, but Ambedkar used to lambast Congress press telling it's a very elite caste-dominated press. 
it knows what news to come what news not to come what to be prioritized what to be you know touched like a pickle you know in a food system like that used to lumbas but this is now not just expanding the issue of the marginalized of dalit we are going to add a lot in terms of gender in terms of children we are all talking today also my university had a program on human rights and human trafficking we talk about migrants you know on pandemic we saw we really really see how many of this was part and parcel of pandemic nothing wrong in talking about vaccines nothing wrong about you know cautioning you but what is the kind of balance what is our priority this is a this is a great question this is a very important question which lingers in every one of our mind nobody says everybody loves media but what is the type of media that is the conundrum i keep talking so chomsky noam chomsky the greatest linguist you know he talks about five filters concentrated ownership owners wealth profit advertising all of this any many of you are interested in this subject to read to understand what law you should read that and media in the third world again i want to tell that we are really thinking one way we say it's more objective many of my friends say oh no no i checked in bbc no no i checked in cnn because they seem to be less bias also they were talking but what is the leading image if you really look you know it is uh, all about what i call as co not just covering problems there is no good things which are part of the agenda because when you talk about a third world we have to really talk about suffering and nothing else more and that again in a way it is a distorted you know thing in a media conundrum so these are the few agencies which by and large there's a huge we ambedkar called it trade now it is a fantastic an mba level you can even start mba in media management media sell media planner media seller media buyer media product you know and add a technology into the whole thing you really really have got a juggernaut i call it called media and then probably it, the fights could be very elitist in one way but it is not about you know what you do or what they say when elephants fight it is the grass which suffers so in indian context very interesting very quickly i will conclude in 10 15 minutes where we are that print media was the greatest instrument for trade unions freedom struggle i told later communist parties dravidian parties in the south recently shiv sena rss add you know all the major parties you know congress somewhere lost its you know own media platform moorings but others have picked up state and television were controlled but now it's all open but still the point is you can have an indirect control because as i told you it's market driven so this is how i want to do but i want to go to the last part there is is there a light at the end of the tunnel is there a silver lining somewhere we call that as social media social media many definitions i like this definition which is very simple it says really technologies that facilitate conversations and what is social media conversation all this of course all are owned abroad right there is a feeble attempt from indian side doesn't matter who owns it but we consider there is a platform so naturally this is a different area of the old media or in other words if i put it radio television or print or passive technologies which broadcast beam information advertisement there's only one way process that's called push technology you don't really interact react and change what is given to you in the agenda whereas internet is called push pull technology which means you could react you can give your comment you can blast some news what happened you can appreciate you can depreciate whatever happens social media operates in that space so is social media an extension of what we consider so long the holy cow called the regular media right what somebody said is a technology does not add or subtract or someone else said it allows people to get together control own destiny i would like another coach or political scientist who said it's imagined communities no more you are looking kings or bishops but you are in a mass literacy we have horizontal ties and one of the pinnacle was lawrence lessig 
the pro acclaimed professor who says online communities were transcending the limits of conventional states and predicted that members of these communities would find it difficult to stand neutral. So this is very much when a, a, a black person was, you know, uh, beaten and killed, you find simultaneous eruption everywhere. And you really nowadays don't want to even see the television or paper. We want to first check in the social media. However, it may be again another fun house of mirror. We want to go do that. Why? I'm, for want of time, this is the best thing happened in one way. Communicative, easy to generate. Each one of us is a publisher. Each one of us could, you know, link with many people. That makes social media very different in terms of structure, function of the old type media in a way. So if I put it, of course, acceptable, personal, political, we all deal in social media, health, humor. But of course, from a legal point of view, the problems are on defamation, false news, trawling, obscene, stalking, instigation of riots, coordination of criminal activities, infringement. But at end of the day, the balance, I will tell, all of these are real issues to be tackled by some legal set of rules. But the greatest thing, which is social media. If I want to conclude, we are in the crossroads with the push technology, with an agenda giving away to push-pull technology. Interestingly, the convergence of media, known as ICT, has opened up a new vista. We really don't know how far this is going to travel and uh, you know do. But let me tell you, in one sense, uh, what we call as commemorating, as I said, the dots, human rights, Ambedkar, constitution, social responsibility, which I told you, and voice of the voiceless. Is it media failed? I think you don't need a great essay to write to say the answer is yes in the last few decades. In, have they succeeded? If, if I succeeded or failed, they succeeded marginally. But if they have failed, steadily they are failing. In such case, is there a new hope? Let me put my closing remark. There was a film, which all of you know, was originally a Tamil scripted film in many languages. And what is this film about? It is typically a good movie maker knows the audience pulse. Normally he knows what is saleable. He knows where to touch because human emotions are mapped very much today. And anyone could really take up something. What is that? It comes to a genere of, you know, what is the journal? The journal is simple. Time immemorial, David versus Goliath, they call it. The oppressed versus the oppressor. This has been there, whether it's an individual family story between, you know, within a family or society everywhere. So you can say it is the same journal. But if I look at it internally, it is about a nomadic tribal people who others don't care about much, about few percentage, especially this. this they picked up one incident from a lawyer who turned judge, a quite a prominent figure in Chennai, Justice Chandru. And from there, he narrated me this story. Uh, we also know because I used to, some of us youngsters used to those days meet Chandru and we are in touch. We knew that is not something new to us. It was there in print media also. It was there everywhere. This was discussed and then forgotten. But again, somebody picks it up, of course, a popular actor and then makes it. So what happens? This film in OTT, what they call, was number one viewership in the world level. That is the interesting point. Not just in Tamil Nadu or within that community. Are you telling Ambedkar and Dalit? You know, not like that. You suddenly, you are touching the consciousness of a lot of people. And that is the job end of the day of media to put somebody to uh, understand, you know, uh, to see, analyze, grasp and react. So you really what a print television radio could not do in a big way in a convergence new media i call i use the word ott because it comes to your home so that's very important going to a theater is not an easy job and a financially big job so you really find suddenly we are coming back to square one that is the new media or you call the social media it doesn't need the kind of structures of the uh, media, what it became so complicated. Is it the one which is the hope? So the concluding remark, I would say the new social media is a first equalizer, hope of equalizer. If I'm jumping the gun equalizer, 
which does not require investments, which in turn dictates the contours of returns on investment. The moment I put investment, then I'm looking at return on investment. I'm tied up everywhere of the old media. The challenge is, will this be again brought under the command and control of dominant ideologies? Or will it herald the era of rediscovering the fourth pillar, what you call the role of media? The verdict is still not out. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, sir, for brightening up this event with your presence and inspirational words, sir. Uh, your words would certainly be a guiding factor for uh, each and every one of us. Uh, dear participants, I'd like to invite your attention towards the chat box. If you have any questions directed towards sir, you can kindly type it there and we'll be addressing it. So uh, one more thing, we'd like to inform all our participants that uh, the recordings of all the webinars that we have been doing is available to the public in the YouTube channel. So all those who are interested can make use of it. So we do have uh, two questions over here. One is from Krishna Prasad Kichu and he's asking, how can we assure human rights for the minorities in the society? It's, it's a slightly different from uh, what sir had addressed, but still uh, he'd like to get your response for this question, sir. Very, if you ask a complex question in a simple answer, if the majority is allowed to behave properly, automatically minorities will, you know, be treated properly because, you know, it is, and as I said, when uh, in a you know, humorous way, but as I said that human beings are very complex carriers of, you know, memory. We don't easily forget things. And sometimes bad memory, good memories, good memories are always there for us. And bad memories or bad ideologies also doesn't go so easily subconsciously. So, as I said, attempts of constitution is constitutional discourse and protection is one way. But implementing constitution is another way what the legal community has to take it up. That's what the J. Beam story is all about. The J. Beam story is about, you know, you forget about the controversy surrounding it. That may be a different platform of, you know, other people criticizing. But the point is simple that, in fact, I read an interesting story. One boy says, after seeing J. Beam, I wanted to pursue law as a profession. I consider all along, we, I think, you know, all of us could be many guilty in national law schools. Why you want to do law? Because you'll get a huge salary and you will be you will be one uh, celebrity like Jet Malani or Nariman or somebody. That's all we are telling. Here is a person who's telling about a lawyer's struggle to put things. That is his inspiration he's telling. So the trigger points could be many. Legal, at least I am from the legal fraternity. That's why I'm quoting JB. It could be many ways, NGOs, activists, many things. But let me tell you, it's a long haul. It is not, as I said, it's not that easy. As you said, if if people are really sleeping, you wake them up. But if people are pretending to be sleeping, you may not really, you know, get the things done. So it's a very complex question. As I said that, I would even say, very interestingly, I would say justice. Life is one hell of a journey of justice and injustice. Interestingly, both of us use the same legal system to perpetuate injustice and to fight for justice. We don't have two parallel, you know, think that they are using something, we are using something. So, as I said, to expect, you know, everything is fantastic and we get up every day morning with, uh, you know, uh, a fantastic thing the whole day, that is not part of the mysterious uh, life which we are living in the planet. But the point is very simple. There are been movement forward. This whole human rights was never even a discussion or a discourse or a concept about even few decades back. You all know after World War II only some rudiments of human rights is coming. Prior to that, might was right. You do what you want if you succeed. If you capture, do what you like. But slowly we are doing, as I said, it's it it'll you move forward, you come back, you move forward. And, but I would say there is there is definitely enough discussion, rationale, that why this is the way forward, right? We may have differences in the way forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for that. We have yet another question from Sandeep, sir, and sir is asking, 
So what is your perspective on journalism funded by the public through YouTube channels like the print and uh, or news laundry? Are they relatively independent and significant enough to revolutionize media? Sure, that's what I hinted in my last thing. I used film as a uh, OTT and things like that as a convergence model. But as I said, the word independent, uh, some of them who are mainstream, uh, you know, celebrity journalists have started their own, you know, thing on edition. They often ask you, like the print or the wire or few of them have come independently. They even ask your small support to do because they don't have a very big string of investment or other pressures of their, what I call as investors being part of an industry and you are part of industry, then you have other issues with their establishment. All these are all not there. But as I said, that was at least a refreshing thing what is happening today that allows to an extent for you to come to terms with what could be the real picture. Sometimes you get completely thoroughly confused when you see mainstream media, two different medias talking two different stuff altogether. And so that is that is the that is the problem i said the media ownership but today when this you said this and independent blogs many of things see we i am looking a lot of uh, you know legal blogs etc it definitely definitely what you call as keeping the hope alive how it is going to turn out i am not a clairvoyant on that thank you sir thank you so much for uh, clarifying that we have yet another question from devi chandana s and she's asking, so social media has its own advantages and disadvantages. We hear a lot about it every day. So what can be done, save the present and future generations from its ill effects? See, that's what I said. It's a package. As I said, law itself or technology itself is not created for this or that. So naturally, that's what I said. People might jump into the bandwagon. The whole question I said about trolling, uh, you know, the whole thing about... Uh, that's what the worry is. Will again social media be turned out to a different type of ownership, or the whole, all, whole, uh, you know, way you are looking at? Uh, then people have to look at about uh, how much control these platforms are owned by people. At least in the world, you know, five, six behemoths control all this, right? Whether it's a Microsoft, whether it's a Facebook, whether it's Google. How far we have to legally see? that they don't go beyond a point where what Noam Chomsky long back wrote, manufacturing consent, that was one of his you know, famous work, that a concern can be manufactured from you if I properly, what you call as, put any technology or any content. So that is a big worry. Uh, we, we competition law, antitrust, many people are looking how much these people can, you know, can they be good enough to leave the platform for others to interact and come or they will be done? And this is very crucial when governments are talking about control over social media. What is the intention? What is the agenda? How far it is justified? To what level you need to really do the ill effects or in other words, not throwing the baby out of the bathwater. That is very, very crucial when it comes to social media legislations, which uh, even, uh, you know, Twitter, all of them are in the courts now, talking about the latest legislations brought. It is not to tell that social media is everything is great and it's fantastic. It has driven people to suicide. It has really demolished people. We have seen that. We have seen that many ourselves, right? And you and I could have been a victim one or the other way. So the question is, uh, it's not a package of good or bad binary. So we need to really, again, use law to judiciously to see that, uh, you know, that that old concept of freedom of expression as done in the Constitution is kept alive. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so we have other questions also, but we'd like to tell the participants that due to lack of time, we'll be mailing that to our concerned resource persons and uh, your queries will be certainly well addressed. So uh, moving ahead. We are extremely delighted to have with us Advocate Mr. Nagaraj Narayan, Advocate High Court of Kerala and Director Kerala Law Academy Law College, who has graciously agreed to deliver the special address for the day. Over to you, sir.
respected chief guest dr vivekanandan sir vice chancellor and other distinguished guests on the virtual dais and off the virtual dais after a very eloquent in fact very elaborate powerpoint presentation and present speech by the learned vice chancellor i think my little contribution to this day uh, may not be so I assume so much significance because it has been a very nice presentation from the vice chancellor dealing with all the issues uh, today incidentally i am given this opportunity and i should first thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity i am privileged to be here with distinguished dignitaries from various parts of the country and uh, they, incidentally it is the human rights day which is celebrated world over wherein uh, we have the united nations declaration on human rights which has adopted on this day and uh, which is a what we call as a very fundamental basic document as far as human rights are concerned so here the topic which i am assigned to speak the contributions of dr b r ambedkar to the indian constitution it's a very wide area which with the 15 to 20 minutes 15 minutes i am given assigned I may not be able to cover all that three expansive one but i could tell you that i can just give some side insights which i have in respect of his contributions to the present constitution and uh, before i may go into that i would say that the human rights jurisprudence all over the world has now come to the concept of the opportunity equal opportunity not only in status and opportunity but also in respect of dignity so it is the human right of dignity which is to be protected which is being emphasized the dignity based jurisprudence is what is being projected all over the world by experts maybe the earlier lady dean of harvard uh, she was she was an expert in human rights jurisprudence especially in dignity based jurisprudence and uh, we have a constitution which was framed by the which was given to us initially by the drafting committee and then which was adopted by the discussed thread by by the constituent assembly and adopted maybe as the first parliament of our independent state the constituent assembly has debated it and finally given it and some of the very important features of the constitution what we see are those of the insights and experience which its chairman had the chairman of the drafting committee dr ambedkar had we see a little parallel between two concepts which are so degrading so much what we call as outrageous one is the concept of slavery in united states and other is the untouchability we had here if you ask me whether it was untouchability or slavery which was the bigger evil well it would be very difficult to say both are such evils that you cannot compare say that which one is bigger and which one is lesser slavery did not involve untouchability in another way the untouchability was even worse in one sense that slavery people were treated as animals but untouchability you cannot touch you cannot go 
mere a high caste man and there they are all segregation was there in us of course even equal but separate rule was there for a long period but it was not that slaves were not untouchables they could be touched they did not have privileges they were treated as animals but here in india it was not slaves but a group of people were found as untouchables maybe that is the reason why in the constitution article 17 specifically says untouchability is abolished which gives a reminder of our back or dark period which the chairman of the as a, of the drafting committee he himself have experienced so there were two instances which are which is often spoken about dr ambedkar's experience one is when he as his elder brother uh, got into a cart and after they moved a little bit the the driver of the cart or uh, the cart owner understood that these people these two people were from the untouchable caste at that time they belonged to mahar mahar caste which is an untouchable caste in maharashtra so the moment it was realized both of them were thrown out and uh, they had to walk the entire way to reach their village and not only really thrown out they were uh, treated in the most uh, most bad manner and the second instance was when dr ambedkar uh, ambedkar as a boy he was very thirsty and he used the drink he wanted to drink it from a public place a public well he used he took water for that reason the upper caste there caught him he was beaten up brutally beaten up because he has polluted that so he had experience and he never went on to touch it but fortunately ambedkar was born as the son of a army personnel his father was in the army and so because of that because of the he was part of the british army the british gave certain privileges as a result of which ambedkar was allowed to study he was the first untouchable to have a higher education to go to university to have university education though he had to face all this he had to bear all this with all the social ostracism and touchability beyond him people segregating him he was a single soul person he endured all this with a pained mind and he came up with all this that is where we find a difference with gandhi gandhi ji when we say about mahatma gandhi mohandas karamchand gandhi he is the face of india a great man but he came from an entirely different set of course he also had certain experience in uh, south africa where he also understood what it means to be a a backward class or a, to be a bad race or lower race and what is the difference between whites and the blacks he also understood but in india his position uh, in the indian society his position was good because he, he belonged to the higher caste the upper vedic caste so maybe there was a different view for him and throughout the indian history we find there is lot there was a lot of conflict between mahatma gandhi and ambedkar and people supporting people like arindu de roy saying that ambedkar was right and gandhi ji was wrong and some others saying ambedkar and majority say and a lot of people saying gandhi ji was right and ambedkar was wrong no it was not personal it was not merely ideological it was something social it was based on principles because you know that the history tells us that there were three round table conferences from 1930 to 1932 and all these round table conferences ambedkar was the only person who has attended gandhi ji attended only the second one the first time he did not attend the third time he was in jail the first time also he was in jail he could not attend the third time he refused to attend gandhi ji and one major reason was that while gandhi ji agreed to give separate electorate it is not reservation as we have now 
separate electorate to both Muslims and Sikhs. He, he did not agree for that for backward uh, for uh, scheduled caste or Dalits as what we call or for the untouchables at that point. Of time. So that was a major round of controversy where Ambedkar was stood his feet and said that no, there is no issue of like that. You want the untouchables uh, want if you can provide separate electorates to Muslims and Sikhs, Sikh community and uh, Muslim community, of course. The untouchables who are being so segregated, who are being shunned by the society, by the upper caste people, by the Hindu people, religion, who are, who are not even part of the caste. They are, they are called as outcaste. Why can't they have, they should be treated as separate. But Gandhiji had a different view. So Gandhiji initially said, if you read through H.M. Suruvai, one of the greatest historical documents which I have read ever was... Uh, Legend and reality, partition, legend and reality uh, by just uh, by H.M. Suruai, his constitutional law has got an introduction, as you all know, which uh, contains around uh, closely typed around 600 100 pages. Now, there he is very critical of Gandhiji, saying that all the maybe Suruai says the reason for mixing, mixing religion with politics, which our country now faces, is because of Gandhiji. He says that he was the person who brought in Muslim fundamentalism into our uh, political movement. He's very critical of Gandhiji. He says that he finds uh, our uh, Jinnah uh, as a different man. And even partition was a result of Gandhiji's reluctance to agree to certain things. At times, Gandhiji was so religious that you take his inner feeling or his call from the above uh, for stopping his Satyagraha. He brought in the Ali brothers, the other one. A lot of things are said, but I'm not going into that. But maybe some may say it has now become fashionable to criticize Gandhiji, but that is not the case with H.M. Survai. H.M. Survai supports all his propositions, all his principles and all his criticism based on documents. Each one is supported by a footnote. What Gandhiji has had said in Young India, and Gandhiji also has a change of mind. What he said in the 1920s is not what he says during independence. When initially, when Gandhiji said politics and religion cannot be mixed, he used Ramrajya, chantings, and all this for the purpose of amassing or getting masses. Later, at a later point, just before independence, Gandhiji changed and said in Young India itself he wrote saying that. India, my religion is mine and state is different. Religion and state politics could not be mixed. By that time, it is too late. That is what uh, Suruvai says. Well, whether I agree to that or not, I'm not saying, but I'm just putting forward one of the greatest constitutional authority in India. Let's put a view wherein is all this have happened. And in 1925, Gandhiji was in favor of the caste system, saying that. It is only the abuse, abuse, abusing of this caste system. What is there? We have to develop this. They have to be the outcast should be brought inside the caste system, and then later he changed into the Varna system, saying that they have to be brought in the the outcast should be brought in the Varna system, and they should be given equality. So, an equality within Varna system is what Gandhiji has depended. He has depended on Gita. He has depended on religious scriptures, but. Ambedkar was totally against all this. He was totally against the Varna concept. He was totally against the uh, equality which you could maintain by maintaining the Varna caste or equality between the various Varnas within that uh, system of Hinduism which was then in existence. Even if you bring that equality, he was not satisfied saying that there were so many reasons. But we should know that that time our constitution and that is why. But one very important fact, very pertinent that it is, that what we have to keep in mind is when the drafting uh, constituent assembly wanted to have uh, appointed a seven member uh, drafting committee and wanted a chairman initially our uh, jawarlal nehru and uh, sardar vallabhai patel nehru and patel wanted iwa jennings to be brought in and he should head the committee but gandhi ji said in spite of all the differences and uh, all these issues which i had and you know the difference when ervada jail 
1932, after the third round table conference, the British said, British agreed to Ambedkar's uh, principle saying that there will be a separate electorate for the untouchables for 10 years. Gandhiji said, if it is not uh, going to be withdrawn, I am going to fast to death. And Ambedkar stood fast. Ambedkar said, I will not do this. I will not uh, budge an inch from here. But ultimately, because of Rajaji from Madras and others, other leaders, they all put pressure on Ambedkar saying that, see, the we are already ostracized. We are all already, we are isolated. We are seen as despised. We are, we are seen as untouchables and for all this. And if because of us, if Gandhiji is going to die, then our situation will be more precarious. So ultimately, Gandhiji, uh, Ambedkar initially said, you cannot blackmail. Gandhiji should not blackmail to put me put us. Ultimately, Ambedkar went to the jail. Edarwa, the jail saw and said, I'm ready to withdraw this. And later, it became reservation, not separate electorate. So that is another history. But in spite of all this, and there were a lot of things where Ambedkar, even during Gandhiji's period, had openly uh, criticized Gandhiji openly and sort of a lot of philosophical. Level. But Gandhiji was the person who advised and uh, suggested the name of Ambedkar as the person to head the constant assemblies uh, drafting committee. Drafting committee, as you know, the seven members came Munshi, apart from uh, uh, our Ambedkar, it was K. Munshi, Aladi Krishna Samya Yankar, Gobala Samya Yankar, then, and uh, this. Uh, what we call as uh, our uh, uh, Sadullah, then Madharao and D.P. Keita. And there it was, and there again a lot of conflicts were there. And uh, regarding untouchability and all these things, even before uh, this was, uh, this came in, the Constituent Assembly adopted and much before uh, it was moved by Patel himself as a bill. That untouchability should be avoided and it should even before the constitution. It was made as a bill and untouchability prohibition it was made into a legislation. But then we should know that our constitution is in 1950. The US constitution is in 1789. It came into effect. 1789. That is almost 161 years before our constitution came into existence. And but it took another 65 years even after the even after the US Constitution came into existence, it took another 65 years for the Constitution, US Constitution to abolish slavery. And you know what happened? There was a war between the South and the North. The South, the North being led by Abraham Lincoln against the South. And it took 65 years after the coming into force of the US Constitution to abolish slavery. And then you see how many years after that? Another 85 years it took for our Constitution to abolish untouchability. So even after slavery was abolished in US, untouchability was here for another 85 years. And don't have the feeling that untouchability is not there now. Even now we get <laughs> get news from the north in Bihar and certain other places. We find instances where people are people are being treated with seclusion or not allowed to use public utilities. People are isolated on the basis of caste, especially saying they are, belong to scheduled caste community. So even after 70 years of our constitution saying so, it has not changed. But same is the case with US also. Racism has not ended in spite of all these years of US constitution. But it is in the mind, the constitution has to come in the mind like it has to work through president's conventions. If we are even after abolition of slavery, slavery was not there, but we had untouchability here for a long period till 1950. 
finally officially we said there is no untouchable and we have the benefit that right from the start of the constitution we have this untouchability abolished while the us constitution had to wait for another 65 years before it could be abolished but we had the other advantage but we are way back well we had to wait for another 85 years after slavery was abolished to abolish untouchability here but i would say that one person who has had a major influence was here but there have been other instances for example 370 of the constitution which granted special status to jammu and kashmir when that was suggested by nehru with uh, farooq abdullah he said farooq was asked to speak to ambedkar Now, Ambedkar said, "I will not budge to Nehru. I, I will not introduce this. I will not say. I am totally against. See, giving special status to Jammu and Kashmir, he was totally against. Ultimately, it was left to uh, Gopal Swami Iyengar to introduce this in the committee and also place it in the Constitutional Assembly." He said. So there were so many provisions which have come in against the wishes of Ambedkar, and. and the way in which we are interpreting the constitution may not be in accordance with what ambedkar has said and of course we the ghost of judicial review the heights of judicial review which the judiciary after madbury versus madison in united states has rested for itself in united states the same its ghost is what we see in india there in our judicial review is also going above all the parameters and exercising powers without any restraint and judicial review you don't call it they say it is constitutional responsibility and we know the collegium system where do you find this collegium system in the constitution it is a constitutional amendment that is made through the judiciary which is impermissible in law and there is no executive there is no parliament which can put the unanimously the parliament has come with a commission it has been struck down and said that the collegium system will continue now you know that ambedkar in the constitutionalism debates and in the drafting committee and in all places is time and again said what is the role of the judiciary the judiciary was only having a very limited role ambedkar never wanted judiciary to be given such a role and that is against that what we find against the intention of the constitutional uh, drafting committee and constitutional assembly ways we have certain interpretations made by the judiciary judiciary there is nobody to write of course there are some voices recently ramnath kovind a president has said made some voices kk venugopal has said about court of appeal and supreme court being supreme court of appeal and the supreme court being separate and supreme court just like the american supreme court dealing only with a lot of of this uh, thinkings not propositions are coming up but they all have to be understood in the light of what ambedkar has said but i would say what ambedkar said then should always be followed because as one of the greatest legends of law just as benjamin nath cardoso said it is not what the constitution maker intended at that time but what he would have intended if he had been now same is said with munro smith another great jurist a lot of legal philosophers said it is the constitutional interpretation it doesn't mean what the makers of the constitution said when the constitution was made but what they would have said if they had known the present day conditions at that time it was bullock carto cart bullock uh, bullock bullock cart and uh, horse carriages now we have supersonic so what was said during the age of bullock carts may not fit in the conditions of travel of today's supersonic jets so what ambedkar said then may not be relevant but what ambedkar would have said if he had known the present day situation of course that is where an imaginary journey has to be made that is where the american realism is realism is and that interpretation should not give so much power to the the imaginary journey through that whether the judges can rest an interpretation which can change the total nature of the constitution that is unwish but i can tell you that 
one of the creators i will just stop with saying if we, we a lot of areas are we this guy i'll stop with saying that the the major contribution the greatest contribution of ambedkar has been his concept of protective discrimination what do we call as compensatory reverse discrimination 16 4 153 now these are all contributions and the us people also are using it by through affirmative action in united states but we have a better system and in spite of all this the position of the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes have not improved any further so article 14 this facets in 15 and 16 have been expanded gender based equality religious equality caste based equality wherein when the caste system for so many years where you have to compensate for that if i go to history maybe another 2 hours i can speak on the atrocities that have been committed which are even greater than what we see in jb the film i must see film the atrocities which have been committed during the earlier days read romila tapa even in kerala read what our sridhar menon in kerala history nowhere is an exception in india and ambedkar has been his concept of po- political social and economic justice it has found its place in article 14 15 and 16 then in the directive principles where socialism state sponsored socialism has been set that has found its way which is now in air with our uh, with the 19th with uh, narasimha rao but of course because the constitution says at least there are certain measures that are being given then regarding the federal structure he always wanted the center to be strong in emergency only not otherwise for preserving the unity he wanted a unitary system but the center to be powerful only during those periods not always and his major contribution i would say was the system of parliamentary democracy which we had and of course we could say it's a parliamentary sovereignty which is being undermined undermined right now because of the larger stress on judicial review and the self assessment which the self engrandment which the judicial itself has made for judicial review and with last these words i conclude saying that we have a constitution where a lot of the fundamentals of this constitution especially with regard to equality protecting human rights from an ankle of the depressed down thrown and oppressed have been protected and of course we have a constitution which guarantees parliamentary democracy as envisaged by ambedkar but undermined by the concepts of judicial review as incorporated here since kesho singh's case maybe incident i would say from the 70s or kesho singh case you know judiciary was asked to decide on the issue of the question between parliamentary sovereignty versus judicial review and ultimately <laughs> the advisory opinion ruled in favor of judicial review undermining parliamentary sovereignty but still 1990 till the hung parliament came the judiciary did not have the have the courage to poke into the parliament but now after Boro Singh Bawo was cheated to come over to Delhi and meet up here because during what change, things have changed. That is another issue. But I would say that the concept which Ambedkar had in the Constitution and the basic concepts are now being changed, and there will come a very strong executive or Parliament. Maybe at times we think. somebody like indira gandhi has to come do i am a total critic of indira gandhi because of the emergency she had she had undermined the constitution but there has to be somebody like that to put the constitution back on track to make sure and say the judiciary that that 
see the constitutional fundamental principles you may have declared the basic structure you cannot go on discussing basic structure one day this way that way and add to it like this the basic structure is what we have understood this is constitution the parliament knows the parliamentarians now are the ambedkars and what ambedkar intended then and what you would have intended now we will decide and we will say and that will give us put in place the constitution the constitution which envisaged by ambedkar before us and hope the judiciary will hear this one day to see that the guardians of constitution should know that this is what has to happen and the parliamentary democracy which was stated by that should be given at most importance and judicial review has to have its restraints and separation of power is not a myth or a forgotten doctrine or an irrelevant doctrine it still has its place there should be checks and balances there should not be judicial autocracy there should not be judicial dictatorship there should not be executive dictatorship there should not be a parliamentary dictatorship now all the there should be check and balance each one should be having who is going to check the judiciary the parliament and executive are being checked by the judiciary but who will check the judiciary there has to be mutual checks and balances somebody has to check the judiciary also they should be made accountable to each other there should be a system in place maybe ambedkar did not visualize this he has visualized separation of power that is why he has said all his debates all his comments all his uh, statements in the constitution assembly would show that he wanted a strict separation of power he never intended such a situation where one wing of the government could run without controls and that is why they should also be made the accountable all the three wings should be made accountable there should be mutual checks and balance what ambedkar envisaged maybe if he had envisaged that he would have brought at that time itself some checks and balances to ensure this with these words let me thank the opportunity uh, the organizers especially safi mohan for calling me and giving me this opportunity i am privileged to be among you is a good all our learned audience thank you sir vice chancellor sir for uh, being uh, with me for for this day thank you sir thank you very much thank you so much sir for your absolutely amazing words so if the participants if you have got any questions you can post it in the chat box and we will be compiling all the questions and we will be sending it to our resource person and due to the limitation of time we are not able to ask it now so please post it in the chat box if you have got any questions thank you felicitation is inspiration to others and motivation to whom you are felicitating we feel blessed to have with us today the presence of respected dr law wellman p assistant professor government law college kori code to share his great insight with us i welcome you sir thank you so much uh, first of all i must uh, thank the organizers for inviting me and also congratulate the organizers for the uh, the kind of green group uh, that is on board to attend the program respect to president uh, Doctor Professor Doctor Vishnu Kapalakrishnan, Dean Faculty of Law in University, the very respected uh, speaker Professor Doctor V C Vivekanandan, the Honorable Vice Chancellor, whom I I had a glance when I was doing my PhD at National Hospital of India University Bangalore, though he might not have might not uh, uh, notice me or recognize me now, but I had the opportunity of having a glance at him. The very respected advocate uh, Nagaraj Narayan, chief of an old block, uh, Mr. Pal Palma Kumar, who is uh, going to felicitate the next. All other participants, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to talk here. In fact, uh, Mr. Jinu, when he invited me to speak, the idea he had in mind, which he put across to me, was this. Professor Vivekanand would be talking something related to intellectual property in the context of human rights. So, as I'm also in the from the same discipline, I can just supplement that. That was the whole idea. But once I got for the and got into the you know the group, and when I listened to the talk of Professor Vivekanand, then uh, I was I was a little puzzled. What to talk about? 
then i was just thinking for this uh, thinking for a topic to talk about and i i know that i'm taking some very valuable time but still i i may have to fill felicity this then i thought uh, the main speaker spoke about media and human rights i would just supplement a question that with a question is right to use social media a human right which because it's a it's a question of which the time of which has come i think i think it is valid though there are certain uh, rules and regulations here and there that is not still uh, an uncharted you uh, know opic uh, legal domain the question is is right to use social media a human right i may not take so much of time i just wanted to flag the issue that and, and just leave there because uh, i am not the main speaker but i think i just i just have this uh, idea thrown up when you consider this as a question the first impression you might get is this is not much to do with the state because the precondition for human right protection is this it should be something which is related to state controlled by state or intervened by state things like that here social media whatever could be the example it is provided by a private company and it is regulated and the, even the content is regulated and controlled by a private company but the things are not that very easy and simple what we can see is if you think further about it using our common sense law is nothing but codified common sense there could be instances of government intervention there could be instances where government will directly control or directly file a case against a person who has posted something in social media the governmental intervention in the social media use directly on the user or it could be something like a use is something like a control or regulation of social media company something which uh, a, a glimpse of a, a taste of which we get in the information technology intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code 2021 it, 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 this, it is discussed and it is to be decided but that could be something of that sort so when there is a governmental what well, there is a governmental intervention any of these kind these these two kinds which i can contemplate now there are certain rights which can come into the net in uh, as human right in relation to the use of social media social media though it is not a regulated media they don't have an editor but uh, as professor vivekananda was say or i would i would i would deduce from that they don't have they cannot have that particular agenda when, when there is an editor when there is a control a centralized media control media they have an agenda and they can take on either this side or that side or, or they need not always you know promote democracy but social media is unregulated to some great extent so that promotes freedom of speech and expression and a corollary of that right to information is also promoted by that and freedom of association is another one which social media promotes over the old ones and the you know uh, no, the young ones so even 10 standard group is still there i am a member of that even right to privacy is an issue when no no uh, when the government intervenes so i am not i don't want to continue so long i'll i'll just i just wrap that up so here a few rights can come within the you know with the uh, in relation to social media as human rights it's especially so in the light of some of the cases like uh, re recent cases like farmiha sharin versus state of kerala where right to internet itself is you know recognized as a fundamental right but at the same time we may have to understand that social media is not that all very good and rosy it could be misused also there are posts which are very objectionable against the state against the stability of the state against the social security so uh, my right to social media should end where your nose begins if i no if i uh, rhyme it with the old uh, uh, no, old uh, old say so what we may have to do is to have a delicate balance between rights and control of social media that is to be charted out but presently if we look at the legal uh, legal uh, legal framework it appears to be an opaque legal domain which is not very clear which can allow the state to you no know, fish in the you no know, no unclear waters so a balance which is something like uh, 
you know, uh, Article 191A and Article 192 may have to be stuck in place and put in place and things should be clearer and uh, rights and regulation based, uh, something like uh, based on the essay of uh, the great John Stuart Mill on liberty, wherein you can have rights, but that, that's, that could be, you know, edited and you know, cut to size to fit into the other uses. So such a, such a kind of uh, legal regime can be in place, the, the details of which are to be, you know, may have to be, you know, um, charted out. So this is a thought I thought I'll just, uh, 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 I'll just, you know, share with the, share with the, the, the esteemed participants. With those, those words, I would, uh, I, do, I would withdraw myself. Before I withdraw, I, I thank the organizers. So I congratulate or congratulate the organizers for having this lecture series. Uh, I congratulate the organizers, especially uh, Mr. Safi Mohan, my, my good friend, Mr. Joe, uh, Mr. Uh, who has invited me, and all other organizers, uh, Gayatri, my student, all of this. So have a nice, uh, you know, uh, way ahead. All the very best to everyone. And uh, it's good to see you on a Human Rights Day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much once again. Thanks a bunch uh, for those absolutely amazing words from your side, Lovell Mensa, uh, and for enriching us with your great insights. Uh, moving ahead, may I now have the privilege of inviting respected Mr. Patma Kumar MM, patron, Mandapa Science Foundation, and head of Department of Media Studies, Rights University, to felicitate the gathering. Uh, so we extend a warm welcome to you. So uh, thank you, everyone. Um, it's uh, such a pleasure listening to uh, such stalwarts in the field. Uh, um, warm good evening to uh, Dr. Bismi Gopalakrishnan, uh, uh, Professor uh, V.C. Vivekanandan, uh, Advocate Nagraj Narayan, and uh, Dr. Uh, Lawwell Mann. Uh, all of them are stalwarts in the field of law, and I'm outside. I'm from. Uh, I'm, I'm not from the field of law. I feel like the outlaw amongst uh, so many people in the field of law. And in fact, my previous speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Lawwell, has law in his name itself, so it makes it <laughs> all the more interesting. Uh, so uh, I may not be able to probably bring in much of legal insights, but I hope uh, from the domain of media and from the domain of uh, human rights at the intersection of uh, these two, uh, I could probably add some uh, uh, value. And uh, I, I did uh, closely listen to uh, the address by uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Vivekanandan, the Vice Chancellor, uh, and uh, there was such a fascinating set of points. In fact, it was a tour de force. Uh, uh, he had uh, almost uh, brought in Ambedkar to Periyar to William Corbett to Sujata, Chomsky, uh, Justice Chandru, and uh, uh, rolled up all of them uh, into a, such a, a short and dense package. Uh, it came across almost like uh, somebody uh, running a marathon in a hundred meters uh, span. So, uh, thank you, sir, uh, for that. Uh, wonderful address uh, on your part and uh, yeah i was also uh, at some point thinking that uh, would sir uh, awaken uh, the um, elephant in the room that is a social media and you did uh, and i was uh, happy that you were uh, touching upon uh, the challenge that the social media is posing uh, to our um, uh, context and uh, indeed uh, the legacy media uh, or what would one would call to be the conventional media tends to uh, have uh, its own patterns of uh, functioning and there is some amount of uh, good research done and uh, some amount of interpretation that's readily uh, accessible and available uh, and which can be dependent upon at some stage. On the other hand, uh, uh, social media uh, is the one that has uh, created almost a riot uh, and uh, it, it is not something that could be easily gauged uh, or for that matter uh, perceived and uh, interpreted. So there is a huge challenge uh, over there. Uh, it, it has been a huge disruptive force, if you could uh, call it, and in many, many ways. For example, uh, who is the producer, who is the consumer, right? Uh, that itself uh, is a question that has been so uh, randomly uh, reworked upon. I mean, uh, we are prosumers now. I mean, all of us are media. In fact, uh, when we post uh, messages in WhatsApp or in uh, a Twitter account, uh, we become uh, producers of content, not necessarily uh, consumers of content. So uh, uh, that's a way in which uh, the social media uh, and uh, the new media operates. And apart from that, the private and the public is another space where uh, uh, the clear distinguish, uh, distinguishing patterns have been removed. So the walls have been uh, blurred, right? And so porous, uh, they become porous. So that's the other one. And the uh, notion of what is truth, what is false has also been um, 
altered. And uh, so we live in an age where we are talking about post-truth, alternative facts, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, the kind of clarity with which one could practice media is now uh, upset because of uh, the entry of uh, the new media and uh, uh, what one could call to be the digital or the social media, all of them. Yeah. And then uh, the notion of what is news and what is entertainment, that also has been severely uh, a challenge right so uh, when uh, somebody is talking about uh, let's say um uh Taimur, there is a uh, kid of uh, saif ali uh, khan uh, uh, we don't know whether they are talking news or they're talking about entertainment and uh, that blurring uh, that is initiated uh, by the kind of forces that are at work uh, is an indicator of the kind of conundrums uh, that media is posing now for our times and there are a lot of uh, things that need to be uh, studied. And uh, as we know, uh, media has the potential not just to tell us uh, what to think, but also how to think. Right. And that is the level at which media has taken over. And it, it is actually uh, uh, holding a huge uh, space uh, in our minds. It, it occupies and rules our mind space. So given these kind of uh, contexts, uh, how do we address the challenge of human rights? That is something that is important for us to uh, open up and uh, discuss. And uh, some of uh, my uh, colleagues who are working in different parts of the world uh, uh, tell us that uh, uh, the social media space is something uh, that has to be very closely studied. For example, it becomes a space for transferring some of the social ills, divisions, biases, and prejudices. Uh, take, for instance, the ways in which um, hate messages are circulated or fake messages are circulated through WhatsApp, right? The general presumption is uh, it is as though the ignorant, uh, as though the uneducated are the ones uh, who are transferring that kind of a news and they tend to uh, create uh, problems, violence in the society, all that. Uh, whereas uh, more and more uh, data that is coming in is pointing out that the biased educated class are the ones who are posing a bigger problem than the uneducated people who are accessing such content. Yeah? And uh, uh, the caste equation that are there uh, in our society, uh, uh, which traditional media was at some level aligning to or responding to, is now transferred to the social media space. And someone who has studied Facebook would be able to tell uh, uh, how much of uh, caste uh, biases or uh, gendered uh, perceptions operate uh, in the uh, social media uh, spaces. Right. So there are newer problems that are emerging. And as people uh, who uh, seek uh, human rights uh, and uh, who believe that uh, the world uh, can be conceptualized in an egalitarian manner, uh, we need to take up these newer challenges, newer complexities, confront them and address them uh, with a lot more uh, uh, rigor and uh, understand that this is, these are dynamic contexts and not something that is very stable. So uh, given these kind of contexts, a lot more hands are required, a lot more minds are required. And so together, I hope uh, we would be able to take up these challenges and address them uh, at some level or the other. And I was also uh, delighted to hear uh, advocate uh, Nagraj and uh, he did uh, bring up a lot of points from history which uh, many of us uh, in the present generations might miss out on. The kind of debates that Gandhi and Ambedkar had in the 1930s is of uh, supreme importance for us to understand why we are the way we are today. Right. So uh, thank you for invoking on those things. And more importantly, uh, you had also highlighted uh, the way in which uh, uh, we need to read Ambedkar, uh, not as he was meaning in uh, his time, but uh, what uh, he should be meaning in today's time. I mean, uh, we need to read, read him uh, in the idiom of the present and not necessarily lock him in the past and think that uh, he has be exactly transferred into our time and made sense of it. That could be a very problematic exercise. And so thank you for uh, highlighting that uh, we need to uh, engage uh, with Ambedkar uh, looking at the renewed context, uh, the evolving challenges, evolving uh, complexities and all of that. So thank you for highlighting those uh, points. Uh. And let me also take the opportunity to uh, thank uh, all the uh, members uh, of uh, uh, the Law and Justice uh, Research Foundation. Uh, uh, really uh, pleased that uh, in the name of Ambedkar, there have been uh, five uh, series uh, lectures that have been uh, conducted and that a lot of such uh, stimulating engagements are uh, uh, initiated. Uh, uh, that's commendable and I hope uh, you would go on to uh, do more and spread knowledge and create uh, awareness. And let me also uh, thank uh, the Mandava uh, Science uh, Foundation uh, uh, of uh, whom I'm a patron and uh, I should uh, specifically thank my uh, dear friend uh, Mr. Daniel Prashant. Uh, Mr. Daniel, are you around? Could you turn on your video and show your face uh, for the audience?
so uh, I'm there, PSP... I'm there, I'm there. Thank you so much. Sir. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, uh, Mr. Daniel was the one who uh, had uh, invited me to come and uh, uh, join this particular uh, group of uh, members. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for all of you for your patient hearing. Uh, have a wonderful evening, and let's all uh, keep. Uh, aspiring for uh, for what Carlo Pertini uh, had referred to. Carlo Pertini is an Italian uh, uh, slow food movement um, activist, and he says, um, "If you sow uh, utopias, you shall reap realities." And I always believe in that, and we need to sow utopias uh, of an egalitarian kind so that we will reap better realities tomorrow. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. We can't thank you enough for your kind words. An attitude of gratitude is greatest of all things. As we are heading towards the winding up of this great session, on behalf of each one of us present here today, may I now invite Mr. Sindhu Joseph, respected president, LGRF Random Chapter, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Sir, please, I welcome you. Thank you, Uttara. I think I am audible. Yes, sir. Fine. Uh, respected uh, Dr. Bismi Gobalakrishnan, uh, Professor V. C. Vivekanandan. Advocate Nagaraj Narayanan, Dr. Lovellman, uh, Mr. Patma Kumaram, LGR of uh, State and Random Chapter Officials, LGR of Members, Members from Mandava Science Foundation, and all others who are presented here. A very good evening to you all. It's absolutely my, my privilege to have been asked to propose the vote of thanks on this auspicious occasion of the Ambedkar Memorial Lecture conducted by the LGR of in association with Mandava Science Foundation. And along with that, as the president of uh, LGR of Trivandrum chapter, it's my uh, pride and moment of pride and happiness as we came to the end of another successful uh, lecture in the Ambika lecture series and on, on this day of International Human Rights Day. And we here in the LGR of, uh, we understand the importance of uh, reiterating the values propounded by Dr. B.R. Ambedkar in the contemporary scenario of our nation. The values um, and the perspectives are eternally relevant and meant to be immortal as long as our nation exists. And at this point, at this juncture, I would like to start proposing a word of thanks to each and every reputed personality who were kind enough to spare their invaluable time with us. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bismi Gopalakrishnan, Dean, Faculty of Law, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kotem, for delivering the presidential address for today's program. Being her student while I'm studying my LLM at the Department of Law, University of Kerala, I was lucky enough to have a personality like her as my HOD, who always show that instinct to motivate the students to attain their maximum caliber in the field of academics. She is indeed an academician with incomparable and prodigious experience. And here it was our privilege to have you delivering a much informative presidential address, ma'am. And I extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Bismi Kopalagrishnan for sharing with us her invaluable perspectives and vision. Thank you so much, sir, for your, uh, ma'am, for your esteemed presence. Next, um, I would like to extend my bona fide gratitude to Dr. Professor v V.C. Vivekanandan, Vice Chancellor, Hidayatullah National University, Raipu, who acted as the backbone of today's lecture by delivering a thought-provoking uh, keynote speech on the topic, Ambedkar's idea uh, and media conundrum in modern times. Uh, I can't thank enough of you, sir, for sharing your views and perspectives regarding the topic. I specifically uh, like to mention your clarification that you've given for each and every questions asked put forward by the uh, students. And thank you so much, sir, for providing us such an informative session, which was indeed stimulating. Thank you so much, sir. I, I also extend thanks to Advocate Nagaraj Narayan and Advocate High Court of Kerala and Director the uh, Kerala Law Academy Law College for its special address on Dr. Ambekar and Indian Constitution and making this seminar a very meaningful one and informative one. He has managed to enlighten each and every one of the, us presented here with this lecture. Thank you so much, sir, for your invaluable presence and this special address. Thank you. Next, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Lovellman P, Assistant Professor, Government Law College, Calicut for sharing with us his visions through a wonderful felicitation speech. He has always showed his enthusiasm and true spirit in collaborating with numerous academic activities uh, conducted by the LJRO. We are very much thankful to you, sir, and thank you so much for delivering the felicitation speech in today's program. Thank you so much, sir. 
I would also like to express my gratitude to Mr. Patma Kumar M. M. Patron of Mandava Science Foundation, Bangalore, and Head Department of Media Studies, Christ University, who gave us today another felicitation speech. And on behalf of LJR of Random Chapter and Mandava Science Foundation, I extend my sincere gratitude to you, sir, for enlightening each and every one of us who are presented here in this lecture by your perspectives. Thank you so much, sir. I also thank Harindran sir, Principal of Kerala Law Academy Law College, who was present here throughout with us in this session. I'm much proud and happy to say that I was a student while pursuing inter LLB at Common Law College, Trivandrum. Thank you so much, sir, for the inestimable presence. And I also like to thank Safi Mohan, sir, who is the backbone of our concept of LGRF and its activities. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for being such a constant motivator to numerous students in the field of academics, and also for standing as a person who always has, always has uh, positive and noble thoughts about the betterment of our society and nation. Thank you so much, Safi, sir. Next, I um, extend my sincere gratitude to Gino M. Kurian, uh, LGR of State Chapter member, for his contribution for his for the smooth accomplishment of today's program and also for, for delivering the welcome address of the program. Thank you so much, Gino. I also wholeheartedly welcome uh, Mr. Sandeep Chandrasekharan for the efforts put in by him for the effective conduction of today's seminar. Thank you so much, Sandeep. And I also thank Uttara and Gayatri for comparing this session in an effective and systematic manner without any flaws. Thank you so much for the invaluable contribution of you both. Last, Thank you, sir. last but not the least, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to all LGR of state and district chapter office, well as members of the LGR of family, members from Mandava Science Foundation, faculties, advocates, research scholars, other respectable dignities who are presented, students, and all other members who have attended this web webinar with prime interest and spirit. Thank you so much, and it is over to you, Pera. Thank you so much for those uh, absolutely gentle words from your side, uh, sir. So before we part our different ways, uh, we once again thank the guests, the participants, the team members and the coordinators and all who have uh, made this event a great success. Also, we'd like to inform you all that the registered participants will be getting their e-certificates from us by filling the link that uh, we will be mailing to you. So kindly take note of the same. And once again, we thank all of you. Thank you very much. Thanking everyone for your valuable presence here. Thank you so much.